Deet, how are you? Doing well, how are you guys? Great, man. So uh, we had a wonderful conversation with Preetha. We did, it was super informative, learned a bunch. And we're here to continue that today. So we have Simok with us. Hi. And we're gonna be talking Hi. about some more fun stuff. So can you give us like, a short introduction about yourself and what you work on? Yeah, so my name is Sumuk uh, Shiva Prakash. And I am the owner of like the replication component uh, that includes uh, replication of data that reliable services use to uh, perform transaction management and things like that. And it is also inclusive of things like transaction management. So where you create transactions across T stores or dictionaries, we ensure like asset properties are met and uh, or if, like other things we do are like if replicas go down and come up, you want to build them back again to the latest state. So that's what the replicator is mostly responsible for, to ensure the data is available locally and in other places in the cluster so that you can recover from failures and have the data available always. Cool. So we're going to dig deep on all that stuff very soon. But first, we'd love to hear a little bit more about you as well. So sort of how did you end up working on this team? How did you end up working on this stuff? Is this something you've been interested in a while? Like how did you end up here in this position? Sure. So I was working in the Windows team uh, as soon as I graduated from college. Hmm. I worked on file systems for a couple of years and I was looking for a change to work uh, in the distributed space because I was interested. Uh, I'd taken a few classes in my master's school, so that what tweaked my interest back then. But I had never tried working on that uh, kind of thing like in the Windows team. So that's when I interviewed with a bunch of teams like uh, Azure, uh, SQL, and places like that. And I think I got sold to this team because I think Gopal like was amazing. So some people have <laughs> seen like, him on an interview that Charles did. Yeah, so. so he's our CVP. So I think the interview with him was something that changed and it convinced me to actually come here. And he gave me a very good opportunity to work here. So, and are you glad? Yeah, it's been very a good experience. Glad. That's why I'm here still. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So, a few people have seen you now in our tour videos, so they know that you sit in 3B. You work with Anurag pretty closely. Yeah. But here, we're going to talk specifically about you know the work that you do. And I see you're armed with a whiteboard marker, and that's really good because we have a whiteboard with us. Uh, so, I'd like to pick up on sort of where we left off with Preetha. So, we discussed a little bit about how. Uh, the T store helps us, or the transaction store helps us uh, provide reliable collections for people. Uh, but obviously, it works with different components inside Service Fabric to be able to do that. Uh, so perhaps let's start from there and draw the little connection between how we go from there to the replicator and, and start there. Sure. So the T store interacts with a component known as. Right, the reliable state manager. So there's a reliable state manager. And below that sits mm -hmm. below that is the log. Right on. Right. So this is the general, like I would say, hierarchy of components. If you just look at a single replica, uh, be it a primary or a secondary. Uh, the lowest level is where I think the log obviously depends on the disk, right? So that's the lowest component. So uh, the replicator's job here is to ensure whatever data is being pumped into by the user, which is indirectly coming to the T store, is replicated to another replicator on another machine, right? So you can think of this whole thing as residing in node one, there's a similar stack on node two. And the job of the replicator is to ensure that there are a quorum of such nodes hmm. that are accepting data from the primary. So the user performs writes only on the primary. So let's assume this is the primary node. So can I pause you for a second? So you used a word that we use a lot here called quorum. Yeah. But perhaps not a lot of people know exactly what that is. Sure. So could you walk us through that concept a little bit? Yeah, so quorum is, uh, in order to have your state uh, reliable across the cluster, you want to ensure that it's not just available in one node, but on multiple nodes. But how, how many nodes is the question, right? Yeah. You could put it on all the nodes in the cluster. You could put it on two nodes or three nodes. So in order to make a choice, we give that option to the user. 
to say how reliable you want your state to be in how many places. And so that concept is called a target replica set size, where we, they can say, hey, I always want, and the usual configuration is, let's say, three. Right? So that means I want my state to be there in three different locations on the cluster. And they're generally on different fault domains. And what that means is, if this VM goes down uh, because a whole rack went down, the other two VMs are guaranteed that they wouldn't go down along with it. So right? we mapped so a physical infrastructure. Physical to infrastructure, yeah. So you can define those things in while defining your cluster. And then we can place replicas in ways that you can guarantee that only one by one they go down during maintenance and things like that. Right? So that's what, and so amongst the three, uh, a quorum, right quorum is always a majority of the three because a majority have to agree in any consensus algorithm, right? So, right. so quorum is uh, defined as like a majority of what uh, the number of replicas that are taking part in a consensus algorithm. So here amongst three, a quorum is two. And in our system, the primary is always part of the quorum. So primary is always included. And so we want at least one secondary out of the three to respond back saying, I have the data as well for whatever write was performed by the t-store. So then we go back and tell to the user that your transaction is now committed or it's completed. Right? Awesome. So that's what write quorums are. And uh, part of the replicator's job is, along with a component which we haven't yet talked about, which we'll talk about in the future, I think, is to ensure that we maintain these quorums and we ensure that any user operation waits for a quorum of nodes to acknowledge back uh, before we tell some work is done on that transaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's where the replicator comes into play. Uh, quorum management is like one of the things. So I'll just jot down the things we speak about. Uh, one is quorum management, right? Uh, the other aspects of the replicator are, or other functionalities, are something that you can think of just locally like durability of your transactions, right? That's the reason we use a disk, because even if this node crashes, it comes back up after some time, you know that the transaction is still residing on that disk because we have a log which is durable. Even if all the replicas go down in your cluster, after they recover, you still have the data because the disk has everything. So mm -hmm. the replicator ensures every transaction that is being accepted and, and replicated is also logged locally into the disk. Right, so it provides the durability guarantees. Uh, it also provides amongst the asset, which are the famous transaction properties. So uh, can you walk us through those very briefly? Yeah. I know we'll cover these more in depth in the future, but just so people Yeah, know. so we spoke just now about durability, right? Consistency, isolation, I think Preeta went over a few of those in yes. the last uh, video that I saw. So most of those are provided by the state providers, which are like T-stores or other reliable collections because they handle how much data to expose while transactions are in flight and things like that, depending yeah. on the isolation levels. The other aspect the replicator provides is atomicity. Right? So atomicity is saying that either all the operations in the transaction happen or nothing happens if things go down in the middle of something. So the replicator has uh, the knowledge of how far the transaction has progressed and if something failed in the middle, uh, during recovery, it knows that something was partially done, so it shouldn't really apply those state changes to the transaction state. And so it's called presumed abort, because if something didn't happen, it means you don't know about it happening. So it uses the concepts of right ahead logging, which means before you want to say something is done or you want to make some state changes to the t-store state, we want to log the intent first. And only after we log it, do we go say it is done. And I think in the last video you saw about, like you heard about things like apply and unlock and those things that uh, T-Store yeah. handles. So apply is what is done when we finish writing to the log. Mm. To say that, hey, you can go apply your state change because we have it on the disk now. So ACID is basically properties that we used to say a transaction is all of these four different things, which are... Yeah. Atomicity, yeah. consistency, isolation, and durability. Cool. Yeah. And that's how we ensure that at all times the understanding is the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this is one aspect. So I would call all these things as transaction management, right? All these are transaction management. So that's the whole category of what uh, the replicator does. So thirdly, think of the log, right? So the log is uh, append only 
sequence of events that kept happening because the user kept doing transactions. You would need infinite log space because the user keeps doing these things continuously. It never stops doing work, right? So in reality, we don't have infinite log space. We want to be able to shrink the log or truncate the log so that we don't run out of disk space. <laughs> and in order to do that, we have to consolidate the log. The replicator, however, doesn't understand that it's the T-store that is using the replicator because I think we spoke about reliable collections in general, right? So there are queues, there are concurrent queues, uh, T-stores, but there can be more in the future. We could have durable logs, you could have other like graphs built as state providers. So since the replicator doesn't really understand the meaning of the data that is being stored, there is a contract even back upwards this way to each layer where whenever the replicator wants to truncate the log, it asks the layer above it, which is the collections, to say whatever state you have so far, write it out to a file. And that will be a compressed state because the t-store would only probably store the keys and the values. Whereas the replicator log contains what were the updates made to that value over the history of time, right? So the t-store's data is very concise, whereas the log is elaborate. If t-store itself wrote its own data to the disk, we could then truncate the log so that we know in combination we have all the state that is needed, right? So that's another part of what the replicator does, basically log management. Mm. Right, and that means checkpoints. The, no, the, the notion of compressing the data and the log to store it in a consolidated state is what we call a checkpoint. And we have truncations where the log keeps getting truncated from the head and it keeps extending in the tail. So it's a circular log in, indirectly. So you, that you can operate with just minimal disk space in order to continue uh, accepting new transactions. Right. So awesome. that is uh, the other aspect and I guess mostly, yeah, I mean the last thing is I guess it's part of quorum management but it's basically build new replicas. Because let's say the user said target replica set size is three, at some point they realize they want higher availability because their customers have a requirement that you need at least five copies of the data, right? So they want to increase it to five. So now you suddenly want all the state that's here to be somewhere else, and you have to transfer all the state from the primary to a new node. So how does that happen? It comes to the replicator where uh, a failover component uh, asks the replicator to build a new replica. So the replicator's job there is to take all these checkpoints that we just spoke about take all the logs and combine them and send it to a new location which is in a new replica and a new machine hmm. and that replica writes it locally and acknowledges it back saying it's all done. So that's when you can say this new replica can also now come into the quorum set and you can start treating everyone as part of the quorum. Cool. Awesome. So yeah, this is the gist of... So just for people that are watching, um, aka.ms sf repo will take you to the open source repo on GitHub, and you want to check out source prod source data TNX replicator, logging replicator specifically yeah. with what you just talked about. Yeah. And then of course there's a reliability subsystem and replication in general. Yeah. So these two parts are in the logging replicator and partly even the build and uh, new replicas. The first aspect of what we spoke, the quorum management and how do you manage right quorums and uh, acknowledgements and replicates, those come under the reliability. Yeah. And check out the Architecture Explorer, folks, and you can learn a lot about how all these systems are put together. Uh, one of the things I noticed in your code, let's go to the logging replicator, Yeah. Uh, is there's this beautiful use of coroutines. Um, and I have to say, that it looks like Service Fabric is the largest uh, user in production of coroutines in C++ yeah. by far. Yeah. And so it looks like this implementation is done down in the kernel in KTL. Yeah. Because um, I notice a lot of K, like K, yeah. K everything. So yeah. 
For the people that are going to be looking around at the source code, hopefully you guys are following along and looking at the source code we just pointed you to. Can you talk a little bit about, because all this stuff has to happen asynchronously. Yeah, yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. So, so I think there are two ways you can, or there are multiple ways where you can implement asynchronous operations. So you want to start uh, some, op some work and you want to be notified when it's done. I think in order to write that code in the olden style that we used to have where there's a begin and end pattern, I think it was also there in .NET long ago, in .NET 4 or like yes. earlier. The code just bloats up, like you have to write a lot of classes and a lot of files to actually be able to write one async operation. Yeah. Right? So co-awaits and awaits in C-sharp actually solved that problem because the state machines were all done by the compiler and all you need to do was write the flow of how your uh, state goes from one state to the other and the compiler handles like the callbacks and everything. So we wanted that really, that simplicity to be there even when we write native code and that's why we were the first, one of the first teams to adopt the coroutines in the C++ which was done by the Microsoft C++. Core. Yeah, Gore and others, yep. yeah. So we use that heavily because one, it was very simple to write all this code in the beginning. So we had to port over some of the code because we had some of the components in managed code as well. So it was very simple for us to port this to native with the coroutine support. And secondly, the K, KTL aspects that you were talking about, it's it provides like compartmentalization and it provides like uh, isolation of runtimes. Mm. So we do things like we count the allocations that happen in every coroutine. We we count how many uh, new objects were up, newed up, and at the end of let's say a workload or a test, we're able to say uh, that all the allocations that we did have to be freed up, so that we know we don't have leaks in the code and things like that. So we have this support in the KTL system where. It, in debug mode, it can actually track every allocation. Mm. And if there is a leak, it doesn't just say that you leaked 10 objects. It actually says the tags of all the leaks are here and they're all in a linked list in memory. Nice. So you can actually go track the linked list and see what were the memory objects that you leaked so that you can go tell how this could have gotten leaked because uh, you had a logic bug. Mostly it's a logic bug because we never forget to free something we knew because we always use like smart pointers for everything. Exactly. So if it goes to zero, the ref count goes to zero, you would end up freeing it, right? But we have logic bugs where there could be circular pointers. So you, you reference something, they reference you back. Mm. Because of that, the ref count never goes to zero for either of us. Right? Understood. So, so we could catch such bugs with uh, support of KTL. That's killer. Yeah, yeah I noticed there's a, a dramatic use of like K pointer. Yeah. Or KS pointer. KS pointer. Yeah. yeah, that's like a shared pointer of uh, C plus plus, but mm -hmm. our own implementation of that, so that we could add all the tagging and things like that. Cool. Really amazing work. So people look at this code. Yeah. Okay. Check it out. So let's continue. Yeah. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about this point number four that you brought up. The build replica. Yeah. yeah sure. So uh, the example that you were giving before is you've come up with three replicas. You want to increase yeah. that to five. Yeah. You now need, you've created a system that's able to go to two brand new machines that have no knowledge of this stack whatsoever. Yeah. And now need to have the exact same thing replicated over. Yeah. So how does that work? I'd love to hear a little bit more about the implementation. Uh, sure. So we could use another part yeah. of the whiteboard yeah. here, right? Let me just get this guy. So. So the end-to-end, -end, I think, needs a few more things that we need to talk about because replicator alone is not uh, the one that does the yeah. work to build new replicas. So there are, so let's say you had a cluster of three nodes or a five node cluster, but your replicas only lived here, right? So this is the primary and you have two secondaries. And there is an API on a service where you can say update uh, service description and you can pass in to say I want the target replica set size to be five instead of three. So what happens there is there is a component that listens to that update uh, in the system which is a central component called FM which we'll go over some other time. Yeah, we will. So that component initiates the process of saying okay now we need two more replicas for this particular service that has these three replicas. So the FM initiates two new build replica calls. And what that does is it creates two empty replicas, right? S4, S3, and S4, they're currently empty. And this has all the state, right? And
and the state is represented by a uh, number because every time somebody does a change to the state, we want to differentiate or we want to associate it with some unique identifier. So we use the notion of a sequence number. So let's say the sequence number at this point was 100. Right. So now we want to build two new replicas and the primary here gets a notification from the failover manager to say, hey, there is a replica that I just created called S3. Here is its endpoint because he knows when he created it, he would have asked, what's your endpoint? And he tells the primary, establish a connection at this endpoint and go build a replica there. Similarly, there's another call to say, there's another replica at S4, establish your connection and build him. During this time, the primary is still available for new writes. We don't block new writes on the primary. So while, so at this point, the build will start. They establish a handshake between these two nodes and the primary actually in the replicator figures out what's the current state on this particular replica. This replica says its state is empty. So it figures out it needs to send everything as the state to be able to bring it up. So it starts sending data from zero to 100, if things started at zero, right? Sure. While it is sending things to this particular replica and the other replica, the primary state could go on to 100, 250. Sure. Right? So things are just progressing. And if the primary is going ahead, it means even a quorum of existing secondaries are also going ahead. Okay. So this is also going to 140 maybe. He's probably up to 150 as well. Right? So this. And so the users are able to make progress on transactions and commits or things are just moving forward. And in the background, these builds are happening. These are called builds because you're building up a brand new replica. So mm. that's why we call it build. Uh, at some point, both of them are saying, uh, they keep replying back to the primary saying, hey, I got your data up to 20. Some, and then they say, I got up to 40. So there's a timer that keeps sending back information saying we received data up to some point. At some point, he would have gotten data up to 100. Right? And that's when the primary knows that he has data up to 100, which is what I had originally when I started this build. And that's the point at which the primary replicator tells back the failover manager saying, hey, I finished building whatever you had asked me to build. Right? So that's when failover manager says, okay, so now you've built him, catch him up. So catch up is a phase where hmm. this extra progress that was made between the time the build started and the current time, whatever extra progress is there, they want to be sent to these replicas. Because before you include them to the quorum, you want them to be as up to date as possible to the existing replicas in the set. So you catch them up, the catch up finishes, which means they got 150. It's possible that during this time it went to 160 as well, right? So this can keep happening, but we right. stop at some point. Right. We say, we stop at some point where we know the additional updates won't take too long to get applied. So that's the reason like we stop after two catch up calls. And finally, the replicator says, I'm done even catching up these replicas. So they are pretty much up to date, like almost up to date to what I have. And that's when the failover says, okay, now that you guys have five replicas, let me increase the quorum from what it was to two to let's make it three. So henceforth, any writes you do will only get completed from a transaction point of view when three nodes have that state rather than earlier, just one more than the primary. So it seems like there's three nice. different phases, phases to this thing. So you have build, which is when you go from zero to 100. Yeah. You have catch up where while you're doing the build, all the incoming data that was coming in, you get yeah. back to those new, newly built replicas. Yeah. This can happen twice. Yeah. Uh, and then after that, what what is the third phase where it's just it's just regular replication based on incoming transactions? Yeah. yeah. So at that point, it's considered done. Yeah. So in this picture that you drew here, right? Yeah. So let's just take this example. Yeah. Uh, assume that these guys have finished building. So yeah. this is 100, 100. This one's at 150. This one's at 150. And this one you said was at 140. Sure. At this point, the quorum hasn't yet been updated. Yeah. When does the quorum get updated? After the second catch up? After the catch up. Okay. So, so he will also have 150. He will also get 150, right? 
So at, at this point, this is still considered stable, right? Because these quorum was actually just, just two, two and these guys are two. Yeah. So if this was not at 150, if this was at 140, yeah. what would be going on in the cluster? If this was at 140, what it means is between 140 to 150, whatever transactions were there, they wouldn't have been yet committed back to the user because it's only there on the primary. So it's just like any new work that comes into the primary doesn't complete immediately. It completes only until one of them gets it when there were three. So that would be the state where you would have some pending transactions that are yet to be covered and committed and mm -hmm. they would all be waiting on getting the acknowledgement back. Cool. Yeah, it's like a, a garden of distributed transactions. It's exactly what it is. It's a fabric of tightly knit. <laughs> well, I mean, components. it's interesting because that's what transactions are all about. You guarantee it's going to either commit or not commit, mm -hmm. and then I can move forth. Very nice. And about this handshake a little bit more, so I guess stepping yeah. back over to this overview. Yeah. So you've talked about how there's bi-directional contracts across each of these components yeah. because the replicator itself doesn't necessarily have contacts on the content yeah. that is passing through. Yeah. So what is the relationship in these two sets of arrows that are right around the replicator? Around these and here? Yes. So actually, to the log, it's pretty much one way. Uh, generally, we don't depend on anything, like any feedback coming out of the log. So I would say this is mostly just one way, where the replicator just uses the log. Like the log doesn't really need anything back from the replicator. So it just uses the log to say, hey, I To say, hey, write this data. So the API is basically right during any new transactions coming in. Hmm. And in order to do these builds, you want to be able to read the log as well, right? You want to read, and we spoke about checkpointing and truncation, so you want to have truncate, so that you like cut the log and it can reclaim that space on the disk so that it's free now to be used for other transactions. So this is the only contract between the log and the replicator. Mm. Uh, going up here, so there's a component I think we can cover uh, in another session called yeah. the state manager. So we'll try to bring Mert in, I think. Yeah, we can so hear from him. Yeah, and yeah, maybe Mert can also talk about he's implemented things like backup restore on the replicator as well. Hmm. Uh, Mert did most of that work as well, so we can talk about that. Uh, I forgot about that being another aspect of what the replicator does. Um, hmm. So it does backup of all your data, including the checkpoint and the log, so that in the case of disasters, you can actually restore back from whatever you had backed up and then continue forward. And uh, there are some great improvements that were done recently where you can go about those things, like you can do backups across replicas and things like that. Great. Uh, so yeah, we'll keep that to another yeah. session. So state manager is again a similar thing where we'll talk about it maybe some other time, but it's basically managing all the state providers here because I think we spoke, I think last time also you guys spoke about the fact that uh, you could have transactions across t-stores, across dictionaries, and across collections. The reason is we have a single replicator and single log uh, which have all those transactions. That's why you could provide atomicity across various things at the top. So the state manager is the component which does the multiplexing and demultiplexing of those API calls and the contracts to N state providers with mm -hmm. just one replicator. So that's the job of the state manager. And the contracts here are mostly, I think some of them you uh, went over last time, which is apply, uh, which unlock. Uh, I think some of them were covered last time. Yeah, right? I think Peter talked so, about them. Yeah, so the additional ones I would say in context with the replicator are checkpoint because we just spoke about that. So that's going upwards here because the replicator is asking the state providers to checkpoint. State mm -hmm. providers don't tell the replicator, hey, checkpoint because it's the replicator that wants to truncate the log because of which it wants everybody to checkpoint. So the API is going up that way to say checkpoint all your state. Uh, there is also state like, there is also APIs to just boot up. When you just create, let's say this replica just went down, mm. uh, you just came back up. It's the replicator that opens first and says, okay, what do I have in my log? Uh, oh, I see that there are maybe some checkpoints that are there and those should be recovered as well and opened up. So there are APIs going up saying open open state provider, recover your checkpoints, and then there are APIs related to backup because the replicator can, can just back up the log. The checkpoints are with the state providers, right? So in order to back up those checkpoints, there's an API going up but saying backup checkpoint, hmm. where all it does is it gives the location of the checkpoint file, and that can be given to the user so that they can back up that file somewhere else. And 
coming downwards is mostly transaction APIs. So things like create transaction, uh, add an operation. So you would have seen, most of the users would have seen the APIs on the dictionary directly, which is update async, add async. Since, again, the replicator doesn't know that it's a dictionary, the API at the replicator level is very simple. It just says add operation. It doesn't say whether it's an add or an update or a delete, because it can be anything. Hmm. So the store or other collections encode what that information is, and they pass it down to the replicator just saying add operation. Hmm. And then there's commit transaction. There's abort transaction. So these are the APIs coming downward into the replicator from above. Excellent. Cool. Thank you. I mean, it makes sense because this this is a distributed system infrastructure. Yeah. And so you can't be too tightly bound to behaviors above you. Yeah. yeah. So really interesting. Like, this is incredible. Let's keep going. Okay. There has to be more. <laughs> more APIs? Yeah, we could speak about more APIs. Uh, well, I mean, I think it's, it's like I mean, there's I, a lot of code. There, there, there are more things, like I think some advanced concepts we haven't yet covered. Uh, those are, I think, like, yeah, it would be used by advanced users and advanced like services hmm. where you could do secondary reads. Hmm. We haven't yet spoken about that. I don't know if that was covered earlier. No, nope, we didn't really cover that. So, why don't we, I think uh, Peter alluded to it, so why don't she we? She did. Yeah, why don't we yeah, talk about so that? Yeah, so we could talk a bit about that. So generally you would write only on the primary because you want one master to tell everyone else, here is the new data, right? Hmm. But you could read from a secondary because everybody gets the data from one source, which is the primary. So it's okay to read from a secondary as well. So a lot of people do it so that their read latencies are lower if they, or they want to distribute, let's say they have lots of reads coming in. Instead of the primary alone serving everything, they can divide it amongst all the replicas so that the reads could be going to secondaries as well. Uh, however, there are some caveats when you read from secondaries because imagine scenarios where the primary is replicating data and after you have replicated some data, uh, let's say the whole quorum goes down or crashes due to some problem. It could be a bug or it could be uh, something in uh, the cluster just blowed up and so things went down. You would never lose data, but what could have happened is if you have read from a secondary, you could have read some data which is not really quorum committed on all the replicas, mm. right? So I mean, we could go over an example, but yeah, that's right. in a high level, so if the primary was at 100 and that was only we'll just take a simple case of three secondary or two secondaries so the secondary was at 50 and this secondary is at 100 right we wanted to issue we wanted to read some data so the customer ended up reading from a third secondary whatever data he read has a version of 100 which means it's let's say the latest version he read hmm. But in this case, it's safe to read that because even the primary is at 100, so you know that it is already quorum committed and there is no problem here. The problem happens if, let's say the primary was at 90 instead of 100. So one thing is you may ask, how does the secondary have 100 right. though the primary is 90, right? Mm. It's possible because the logs and disks are not at the same speed on all the replicas. The primary disk could have been slower compared mm. to the secondary disk. So maybe the network was fast enough to send it there, but maybe the write on the primary itself to the log might still be ongoing. So the primary truly has only up to 90, even though in memory it has everything up to 100, but on disk, which is durable, is maybe only up to 90. And this secondary was super fast, so as soon as it got it, it wrote all the data, so it's at 100 already. Hmm. So a user did a read and he got 100, right? The 100th version of that data and he thinks that is, let's say, the truth. Now, take a scenario where everyone just crashes. All the replicas just crashed for some reason. I mean, most of these are, that's, it's not too often that you would hit it in production because all replicas crashing at once means something really is wrong. The host operating but system restarted. You could have it, yeah. We could come up with these scenarios where yep. it's possible, but it's not really practical always. Yeah. But after everyone crashes, let's say this machine went into maintenance because it had a bad disk or sure. it had a bad memory or something. So it went into maintenance, it never came up. Mm. These two replicas come back up, right? So if two replicas come out of three, you still have quorum. 
So you are allowed to continue and say, we will accept, we start accepting new rights and we will start maybe building a new replica because this replica never came up. So we could build a new one. But even without building a new one, there is a problem here because you read 100 from a secondary, but you go try to read it now, it's not there, right? So that doesn't mean you lost data because a quorum of them never agreed on 100 in the first place. So you have basically read something called false progress data. Mm. Interesting. Right? This is what false progress means, which is you read some data and false progress can mostly only happen when you read sec from secondaries. Mm. If you always read from the primary, it's rarer for this to happen. But since you read from a secondary, you read something which was not quorum committed. And after some time, you will see that that data doesn't exist anymore. So is there a way for this, so systematically, so the system itself to prevent yeah. users from ever doing this? Yeah, yeah, so that's one of the features that has been an ask by a customer where they want to be able to read from secondaries, but they don't want to read false progress data. <laughs> right? So that's possible. So okay. we are working on that. That's an actual feature we are planning on building. Awesome. To, uh, where if the user tries to read from this particular secondary S3, even though it has everything up to 100 on the disk, we only expose things up to 90. So because we know sync. that the primary is at 90. So how do you do that while still making it efficient for users to use the secondary? Because the whole point of reading from the secondary was so that uh, you're not locking the primary, you're not yeah, yeah, yeah. having high latency. Yeah, yeah. But if you're at the same time checking what's in the primary, then how? Oh, no. So the checking doesn't mean that you would actually go to the primary and ask what okay. it is. We encode all this information in every message we send. Sure. So essentially, primary, whenever it's sending any data to the secondary, it puts in its metadata saying, hey, so by the way, so far, up to 90, everybody is agreed upon. So that way, that data is always a little staler than what is the latest data, but it's always up to going 8%. to be core and committed for sure. So it is safe to read it always. So cool. is the LSN, you mentioned the, yeah. uh, that's a number. Yeah, right? it's a 64-bit number. 64-bit number, yeah. so a long-ass number. Yeah, it's okay. a version number. Got it. Yeah. And that's how you keep, those are all unique yeah, log so entries. Yeah, we always increase it every time we keep taking new writes. And uh, that's how you know that if you read a key in a D store and if it says the version is 100 versus you read it sometime later and if it says 200, you know which is newer. Got it. Because 200 happened after 100. Nice. This is awesome, man. Yeah. This is so, really fun. I want to circle back a little bit on some of the stuff that you guys might be working on now. So without you know, divulging too much info yet until we go to open development, as Charles keeps reminding me. Uh, I'd love to hear about, you know, some of the bigger challenges that you guys are currently facing and how you're thinking about solving them. I think one of the challenges or I think an interesting challenge project that we're working on and uh, is we have to, we want to support uh, Geo soon so that we don't want people to store their backups in another cluster in the case of disasters and things like that. So, so just so people know, Geo, you mean Geo, Geo application. application? Yeah, so mm. that's an up, I mean, that's something in the works that uh, everyone is working on in the team. Uh, so that whatever we spoke about so far is all within the cluster, right? And you could do Geo by just having more replicas in a different cluster. Uh, the downside to that is your writes latency becomes very slow because now you're waiting for acknowledgements from a different cluster. So that's a network hop to a different region. Mm -hmm. So that's not the most efficient way to build it, right? So that's more like just building, that's more like just extending the cluster to different regions. Mm -hmm. So the other option is you can have a clone partition. You have a partition here and you have another clone partition somewhere else. And in the background, you keep sending the data. And so there are various ways to design that. So that is something in the works. Uh, and I think to do that with uh, RTO, RPO, like uh, guarantees is is something which is very challenging. Mm. Um, I think the other thing the team is working on is, uh, is, is like split merge of data so that you can elastically scale out and uh, scale back in mm. depending on how much data you have in your partition. So if your partition has too much data and your disk is maybe not able to handle all the data that you want to store just on single machine, mm -hmm. uh, you want to be able to extend the number of partitions so that your data gets divided. 
So we need to take the existing data, break it up into parts that can be sent out to other partitions so that now you have more partitions with new nodes being added to the ring or when you want to combine them because you don't have that much traffic like let's say in, the, in some season you just want to remove some nodes and then scale back in so that you are using lower number of VMs. So you know interesting that the problems you're speaking of have probably are ones that are also faced by like SQL Azure. Yeah. Right? And yeah. people that are building these scalable database systems, yeah. regardless of their specific data formats and blah, yeah. blah, blah, yeah. they have similar problems. Yeah. So you work, I mean, we are underneath SQL Azure, for example, yeah. supply them with a lot of capabilities. Are you working with that team to help solve some of these problems? They actually have a pluggable component for the replicator itself. Mm. So they had implementations of Geo and Split Merge, I think, way before uh, we have had to think about those. So. Mm. They had to just plug in their components to our system to write their own replicator. And even though we don't support it directly with them, they, I think, have existing solutions that work for them, which they already use to do like geo replication. They have two clusters. And what they do is in the background, send the data on their own without really depending on our stack to actually support it. Cool. Nice one. Cool. Thank well, you, man. Yeah, I hope that was, you know, I learned a lot from it. I know, I know Charles did. Totally. You guys My hair is gray, or I feel like a professor now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank yeah. you so much for your time, so I really sure. appreciate it. Yeah, this absolutely. is great. It's my pleasure. And yeah. we'll probably have you in again, actually, at some point when sure. we hit the other side of the stack a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. And also, I'd like to, you know, propose that we sit together sometime and go through some of your code. Yeah, sure. And we could use some fancy software. Yeah, uh, and a screen cap. Absolutely. Screen capture that. I think that would be fun. So you guys navigating through the, through the code with Simok or yeah. something. Yeah, it's yeah. really worth spending time because it's some beautiful stuff. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.